Uh, my wife and I, our first church that we pastored was in Raton, New Mexico. We didn't pioneer that one. We, we took over it. And so uh, anytime you're taking over a new work, the guidelines are usually don't do anything, uh, uh, any changes for a year, you, you, you know. Uh, and so uh, because things have been established there and it's important to get in there and win the people over. And, um, but I remember that, uh, you know, we had done that. God was helping us. We were actually having the young people from Trinidad, uh, you know, Colorado come over. And so it was just a, a great time. And then uh, uh, I was at a conference in, in uh, uh, this was back when we used to go to conferences in Gallup as well. And it was in April. And uh, I remember that while I was in conference, you know, there God was stirring me up, you know, for, uh, you know, I, I didn't really know for what. All I know is that I enjoyed the preaching. You see, that's what conference is about, so that you can come and you enjoy the Word of God and it stirs you up and, and gives you clear direction. And, uh, and I remember that uh, uh, Pastor Fred Ruby at the time was looking for somebody to pioneer uh, a brand new church in Pueblo. Well, you know, I was enjoying li living in, uh, in Raton. We had those relationships. And so I was like, man, Pastor, he told me directly, I'm looking for somebody to pioneer a church in, Pue you know, in Pueblo. And I said to him, well, Pastor, I'll pray for you that uh, somebody rises up, you know, and God gives you men to do that. And, uh, you know, uh, because we had established some good things there in, in Raton, and, but as I was listening to Pastor Mitchell preach about a, a man who was a, a missionary, I think it was in Africa, and the man was already like 75 or 80 years old, and, uh, and his time was finishing in his, uh, there for his missionary work. He was already sending Pastor Mitchell the map of another country, being stirred up. He was going to leave a powerful work he had established. So I was like, wow, man, you know, uh, I need to obey God, you know, and, and so I, I repented from my attitude of, you know, this is my comfort, and so I told Pastor Fred, we'll do it, you know, I talked to my wife, we, so we left Raton, and then we went and we uh, pioneered in, uh, uh, in Pueblo, Colorado, and, uh, you know, that church, Roy Garcia and them have it now, and, and God's helping them, and Larry is, uh, is the fruit that God gave us, Larry and Lisa uh, from there, and then later on they went on to pastor. So you never know what God is going to do when you obey Him. And so, you know, but uh, so the, the conference we know is a time when God stirs us, when we meet with God more than just regular services or revivals. It is just, uh, uh, if you were at this conference, uh, uh, even if you came for one or two services, there was a, such a, a, a supernatural uh, presence of God, conviction, and, and it was like a, a mountain top experience where we, we met with God if you were open to Him. Some of us resisted the Holy Spirit and God spoke to us some things, uh, or some of us made some commitments said, yes, God, but a week has already passed. And I wonder what has happened to those commitments that you and I have made with God. So we're going to, <clears throat> we're going to look at the mountaintop experience of three disciples who went, went with Jesus. And they had an encounter with God up in the mountain. And so we're going to be looking at that. And... Uh, and so now, now conference is finished, and now it's after conference. And what are we going to do with the stirring of the Holy Ghost during conference? So we're going to see that this is all part of God molding us into disciples. Each one of us, male and female, we're all called to be disciples. Not just, uh, you know, uh, come to church, go home. And, but, uh, but we're called to, to learn of the Lord and uh, uh, let Him mold our character into, the, into His character. But let's look at, Mar at uh, Matthew 17 this evening. And we're going to look at the Word of God there with you for a little bit here tonight in Matthew 17, starting in verse 1. Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Those are, the, those, are those three disciples I was talking about. Uh, Peter, uh, James, and John, his brother, led them up in a mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before him. His, his uh, face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white uh, as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered, said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you, uh, if you wish, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, uh, and one for Elijah. 
While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased to hear him. Skip down to verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to Jesus and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon that came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. The disciples then came to Jesus privately and saying, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So I want to just entitle this message after conference. Now, um, I was talking about Larry and Lisa, and I'm, I, I look back at those years, uh, uh, and I'm sure that God gives us opportunities because He gets the glory anyway. And, uh, you know, I'm just wondering what would have happened if I would have just been disobedient. I said, no, you know, we'll, we'll just like this comfort right here where we're at. And we don't want to, you know, I'm just wondering if, if they would have gotten saved and if they would have rose up and if they would have gone and done a wonderful uh, work for 10 years. They labored in Santa Rosa. And you should see now that church flourishing, young people in there. What, what would have happened? And so our obedience does make a difference, whether it be for good or for not to, so good. So let's look at, at these things that happen uh, in our life, uh, you know, uh, for conference and then the decisions that you and I need to, to fulfill after conference. The first thing that we see here is that, uh, that they had an experience with God up in the mountain. So there are, there, this is, there's a reality in our own lives uh, of mountaintop experiences where you have such an encounter with God that is beyond the ordinary course of life. Where you're just praying and it just seems like heaven is coming down or you're going up. It almost seems like you're enraptured in your prayer. There's a, a, an awesome presence of God uh, that you cannot deny. And so we have those mountain uh, top experiences. And this is what happened to the disciples. They went with Jesus and they had this, uh, there was the Father speaking for Jesus and Elijah and Moses, these powerful prophets. And they were so moved. They're like, man, this is it. We're, we're having this encounter with God. There's such a closeness. They didn't know how to act. Here's Peter saying, well, he didn't know what to do. We'll just build a, a temple to you three. You know, and so, but he, he's so excited. He's so moved. And this is what, what happens with these mountaintop experiences. As a matter of fact, in Matthew 17, 1 and 3, after six days, the Bible says Jesus took, in our text, Peter, James, and John, and led them up to a mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with Jesus. Can you imagine that? I mean, I don't know about you, but when the presence of God comes down, there's such an expectancy. There's such a personal revival. There's such a, a supernatural confidence that, that says, God, I feel like I'm on top of the world, man. I can overcome anything. I can go anywhere, God. A God, you can help me in every circumstance. That's the kind of experience that is a mountaintop experience for you. It's almost like you come face to face uh, with God. We see, we hear, and feel things uh, that maybe we have not before. We have experiences, uh, you know, during conference where our lives are, ref are refreshed. Uh, doesn't matter if you're a new convert uh, or an older convert or where you are with God, male or female or a teenager. There's just something powerful uh, about uh, these conferences, for these, these mountaintop uh, experiences. The common reaction sometimes is... Uh, Man, I, I wish this conference would finish. There were some, some folks that were uh, at the, towards the end of the conference. They would come up, hey, it's such a powerful thing. We appreciate your guys' work, uh, the labor. Man, I don't even want to go home. This is what the, You remember your first conference? I mean, when I went to uh, my first conference, I went, you know, I was a college student, and I, my wife and I weren't married yet, but I remember I think I had like 10, you know, $10 worth of food stamps in my pocket to survive the conference. I didn't know anything about conference. It was my first one in Tucson. I slept on, in, somebody's, uh, in somebody's room on, on the floor without a pillow. I mean, it, it didn't matter. 
I just wanted it the, to have that experience that they talked about. Hey, come on. You got to come to conference. It's so powerful. It's so wonderful. It's like a, a spiritual honeymoon. And so when I went there, I didn't want to come back. I was like, man, I got to move to Tucson. I, I got to just stay there. I just felt that mountaintop experience. There was that freshness. And this is a, you know, what God wants to give us and continue, continue to give us. So that you and I can experience and say, God, this is something that is in me that is real. It's not just feelings and emotions. It is something uh, that has changed the way that I think and look uh, uh, you know, towards uh, the things of God. It is a mountaintop uh, experience. It stirs you up. This is why Peter has this reaction. As I mentioned, that, you know, hey, we got to build some town. He didn't know how to act. He did something different uh, than any other time uh, that he was... Uh, with Jesus. We need to understand the overall picture of what is happening in our text, that God is doing something. He is developing His disciples. He wants to show them that the work on the earth is from heaven. When God speaks, listen to my son. When God says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Uh, they got, Jesus wanted them to experience that. And this is what God wants to do for us. He wants us uh, to know that the work that we do is not a, a, not a work for man, it is not our own work, but it is a work for the living God that he really is involved. And he gives him this vision, and he gives him this revelation, the three, the closest ones apparently that later on became leaders uh, amongst the disciples. Uh, he showed them, he revealed uh, this glory to them. And these are wonderful mountaintop uh, experiences because God wants to move us. From the very beginning, when we first give our life to Him, He wants to, through the process of time, we ought to be, a, uh, we ought to have a, still a continued mountaintop experiences, a continued freshness, saying, God, you know, I, I was telling, I, I think it was Daniel, I was telling him, you know, I, I need, I want to uh, put a sermon together uh, called, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a concerning the new converts. You might have your old body. You might have your old person that you are. But God gives you a new mind so you can begin to think differently. But also for the, for the older convert, you know, that, uh, uh, that it, it might be an older convert, but God can also give you a fresh mind so that you can say, you know, God, I want, I want to have that honeymoon effect. I want to fall in love with you again. Lord, I want to go wherever you want me to. This is the purpose. That we, these are the things that we experienced that God spoke to us. Many of us were moved, decisions that we were making at that time. However, how many knows you can't stay in the mountain all the time, as I mentioned. You can't always stay in that spiritual high, that supernatural touch of God. Sometimes reality comes, it's like, hey, come back to earth. We're not in heaven yet, and we have to come back down to the valley. So the second thing you want to look at is down in the valley. We have to learn that sometimes we're going to have to deal with disappointments, even after we've had a great victory in God, even after God has moved us and touched us, that sometimes uh, we do, are going to face uh, disappointments. This is a simple truth here. The Bible says in verse 9 that they came down from the mountain. Oh, how they wanted to stay up there. No, we don't want it. But they came down from the mountain. We cannot always stay there. But it is going to develop us as disciples uh, of Jesus Christ. This is what happens, you know, sometimes even, uh, 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 even during conference, we have made some decisions. Said, yes, God, we'll go here, we'll go there. Or, yes, Lord, I, I'm going to, to go ahead and be the next door director. Or, yes, God, I want, to use, I want you to use me in the body as a, uh, as a Bible study leader or youth leader. Or, or, God, I need to make some real changes. I need to be, quit being so concerned about me and myself and I, you know, and, and, uh, or, or about my situation. These are things that God speak to, speaks to us. This is what He deals with us. And, you know, and, and so, you know, we, we come, you know, to this place where God wants to do something new. And this sometimes is a, is a test. Will you and I continue in that supernatural conviction that God gave us? Or will we quit and get upset because, uh, you know, we, uh, we feel like, you know, maybe it was just an emotional high or, th or they were pushing too hard. And, oh, man, they just make us feel guilty. They want to make us feel guilty. That's what conference is all about. Or we can say, you know what? No, there's a difference between feeling convicted when God deals with you about your character. 
about the way that you treat yourself and the way that you treat your husband and the way you treat your wife and the way you treat brethren in the church or the way that, that we treat people outside of the church. Whatever it is, there are characteristical things that God deals with us that, that uh, helps us and, and, that, that deal, and, and that we, God says, you know what, God help me not to be such a jerk. Help me not to speak so, so cruel, cruelly. Lord, change me. Help me to guard my words and my mind. Help me to guard my attitude. Because how many you know we can, people can tell how we feel sometimes just by the look in our face, just by the way we carry ourselves. And so God deals with us about all these things, about rising up and pioneering, about rising up, and, uh, you know, uh, becoming an evangelist as our brother did, rising up. And, and you know, God, I'm going to be more involved in these outreaches. I know we need to build up uh, the house of God. There's too many empty chairs, Lord. I'm going to be more involved. You know, I mean, God, God, when I was sitting back there, I was like, God, I need to win more souls this year, man. I need to step it up. I need to do whatever I can, whether they're from the west or, or the east side or at Walmart. or Personally, I don't have to wait for us to have a concert or a healing crusade or, or a Bible study. No, Lord, I want to do more for you. That's what God was showing me, areas in my life where, you know what? You need to let this go and you need to let that attitude die. You need to, you need to have a new mind. Because sometimes we excuse ourselves. I've been around for such a long time, you know, and I've done so much. Well, that's good. But you're not dead yet. When we bury you, then that's when your work stops. Can you say amen? But there is a death that has to come. It's that death to self. A death to our own will. Saying, God, you know what? I might not feel the same things. I know that it seems like the conference spirit is fading. But Lord, I made some commitments to you. I made some pledges to you. I came to this altar not just to be seen by men or because it was filled. I came to this place to make some real commitments. And how many know the commitments that we make before God at His altar are written in heaven? God records them. God does not forget. See, how you handle what God did for you in conference, after conference, will determine how, how closer you'll get to God. It'll determine your destiny, your future. And if you're married, he can't do it without you and you can't do it without her. The Bible says that married couples inherit eternal life. Imagine that. It's not just about eternal ministry. We, we, are, we are inherit eternal life, the eternal blessing of God together. And this is why it's very important. This is why it's very important too for single women and single men. You better be careful who you marry. You better pray and say, God, send me a man of God. Not, you know, Goliath was just, send me a man. Well, he got more than a man. He got the God's man, and God, God's man killed Goliath. Amen. Put him to death. But you need to pray, God, send me a woman of God. Lord, help me to be that man. Help me to, to be that woman. God, help us in our marriage. Help us in our life to help our pastor build this congregation. The final thing this evening, well, let me share this scripture with you concerning down in the valley. Or you come to reality. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, the Bible says, Be alert and on your guard. Stand firm. Firm. Be immovable in your faith. Being alert is, is be prayerful. That's what that means. Be on watch. Be concerned about the things God wants. Be concerned about eternal things. Be alert and on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. And then he says, to the men, act like men and be courageous, grow in strength. You know, that's just the truth of the way God established it. Before he brought Eve to the garden, he put Adam there and put him to labor and to work and he blessed his work and then he gave him a helpmate, a helpmate, gave him a wife to work together the things that God had prepared for him. The final thing here tonight concerning after conference is that we have to examine our own hearts. See, an encounter with God always leads to a self-examination. Because it's so easy to examine others and worry about what they're doing or not doing, but it's a lot more difficult to examine our own heart and our own life. What we're saying and not saying, what we're doing and not doing. And so this is, a, this is a, that encounter with God brings us that personal revelation of who we really are. Because when you compare yourself to the background of somebody else's life, uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't uh, turn out too good because you're always going to be on top. But when you and I compare ourselves to, Lord, to the Lord Jesus, 
his work and his exampleship and his labor, how many know it really shows us who you and I are? See, we sometimes have to face these hard questions. Am I doing something personally that is stopping God from speaking to me? You know, I, I was very um, moved this morning with the service, not only because of the prophetic word, but because of the silence. The silence for what seemed to be a long silence. And I was reminded of in heaven, the Bible says that in heaven there is a long silence. It's almost like there was such a depth of, of, of what God wanted to speak to us, not only with the prophetic word, but there was something else that our Father in heaven wanted to speak to us. And maybe as you were standing there, you're like, I wonder what's taking so long. I wonder how come I'm not feeling it. Maybe, it's, maybe we need to ask ourselves, God, when there's such a powerful presence of God, why is it that I don't feel moved? Why, God, aren't you speaking to me? What, what is it in my life that has kept my ears, my, my, my heart, my mind from receiving, my spirit from accepting, God, what you have for the rest? Why can I not hear, can I not hear your voice personally? Maybe there's some things in us as individuals that need to change where we can hear God's voice clearly. In verse 5 of our text of Matthew 17, the Bible says, While Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Hear Him. And so here's like the Father confirming the ministry of Pastor Jesus, because that's who he was. He was not only, he was um, more than that, the Savior, their Lord, their Master, but he was their, their, their first pastor, the first pastor of the Christian church. All God and all man. The man God. He said, hear him, listen to him. Because we know what Judas did. He did not listen to him, and he betrayed the Lord for silver. I wonder how you and I betray the Lord. Do we betray the Lord for unclean relationships? Do we re betray the Lord because of uh, unclean attitudes, wrong attitudes, a uh, 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 wrong criticism of others. How do we be, do we betray the Lord? Or are we able to say, Lord, yes, I hear you. Yes, I will listen. But one thing that stands in the way is pride. When our pastor brings some sort of encouragement or instruction, or maybe even a brother or sister in the church that is trying to help you, how do you receive that? Does pride rise up and say, huh, who are you? I'm more educated than you. I'm older than you. I've got more money than you. I've got whatever it is. Pride has many voices. Are you teachable? Do you ask questions when you don't understand? Do you open yourself up to the man of God that God has put over us? Or do we just isolate ourselves when we're struggling? See, the devil's strategy is for you and I to not hear the voice of God by isolating ourselves, by making ourselves deaf to those that want to help us and strengthen us and refresh us. And so we have to examine our hearts. Am I open? Am I teachable? Am I humble? The second thing we must ask ourselves is what is it that is stopping God's power in my life? The Christian life is not weakness. Can you say amen tonight? It's power. I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, the Bible says. It is power. Why don't I have power? What is stopping the power of God in my own life? We see that in this text, here's this man, he has a need, brings the, his son to the, uh, to the disciples. And in verses 19 and 21, the disciples came to Jesus privately, pulling him aside. Why could I not cast it out? And so Jesus tells him why. He says, you're lacking faith. And he says, some of these don't come out except through, through prayer and fasting. See, see there, there are times, you know, as, as they did with their pastor, there are times you're going to have to pull your pastor aside privately. Why can't I overcome this? Why am I still thinking this? Why am I still going through these things? And there's insight that God gives us through our headship. And this is why it's very important that we say, you know, why is, is, uh, what is happening? Why is God's power not at work in me? Have we been coasting? Have we been spiritually lazy? Have we been laying a hold of God? Is there fruitfulness in our life? 
Do we have a desire to see people saved? Do we have a desire to follow up on new converts? Can I help an older convert? How many of you know that sometimes older converts in the church need, a, uh, need some help too? Can you say amen? Need, to, need that fellowship, need that lifting up. Am I involved in the life of God's people? The final thing concerning examining our hearts is, God, am I meeting the needs of your people? Am I serving others? I'm reminded of that story. I don't remember if our pastor said it or somebody else said it. About these women that were losing their minds and they were rich women. They had everything in life that they thought would make them happy. And they started ending up at the mental institutes. But they started leaving the mental institutes when one woman decided, I'm not just going to sit here and sulk and be a pobrecito me. I'm going to start making stuff for others. And she began to sew and, and make things, little gifts for others. And she began to send them out, give, to, give it to this person in the street and give it to that per, And before you know it, her sanity came back. Because when you and I give of ourselves to others, it clears up our mind, it clears up our thinking, it gives us a, a sure path to the will of God. And this is why it's very important. We have to say, okay, God, it's after conference. Those decisions that I made, am I going to follow through on it? Because we're pretty good at not following through. We're pretty good at becoming fearful. And God's will say, you know, I'm the God that changes you. I'm the God that helps you. We heard these powerful prophecies this morning. I'm your father. I will take care of you. I will be merciful to you. And so I want to encourage you this evening that God, what you spoke to me in conference, it's after a week after conference now. Am I going to fulfill that pledge? Am I going to fulfill that commitment of service? Am I going to let you use my life the way it should be used? Let's bow our heads together in this place. The supernatural work of God in the conference, the sermons, all these men preaching in the, in the one direction, let your light shine, being the light. It brings light to dark areas in our own life. If we're willing to let God help us. Sometimes we just need uh, to have our mind be renewed by the, uh, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, Paul writes. He's encouraging them, come on, rethink things. Let God put fresh thoughts in your spirit, in your mind. Come on, rise up. Step forward. Take a step of faith. Oh, but I failed. Welcome to the world of failures. I have failed so many times. But, I, but a God is not a failure. He helps failures like me. I've blown it. I've turned to the left when I should have kept going to the right. I've messed up and done things wrong. I've had wrong attitudes and hurt people. But it doesn't mean I'm going to quit. It means, you know, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm going to make those relationships right. I'm going to make my relationship right with you, right with myself, right with others. I'm going to let you, God, fulfill your plans for me, what you spoke to me, the convictions. I'm going to step it up because it's all about Jesus. If you're in this place tonight, you're not right with the Lord, I want you to lift up your hand and get right tonight. Say, you know what, that's me. Pastor, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to recommit my heart to him, my mind, my attitudes. I want to be forgiven. If you never uh, have accepted Jesus inside of your heart, lift up your hand and we'll pray with you. Anybody at all, real quickly. Maybe you're away from the Lord, you were doing so good. Oh, you felt that close, that you had that mountaintop experience like these disciples. You heard the voice of the Father. You sensed the presence of the Son. You had the power of the Holy Ghost. But then you turned away, and you're away from the Lord, far, far away. You've allowed this, your sin to take you further than you thought it would. It's about decisions. Now you can come back and say, you know what, God, I'm coming back. I'm not staying there no more. If that's you, you're back today tonight. Lift up your hand and let us pray with you tonight. Anybody at all, real quickly. Amen. Maybe then, tonight, uh, Christian, as we came to conference as the word of God was preached 
decisions that we made and and here we are a week later. Where, where are we at now? Are we still, do we still believe what we heard? Do we still believe what was preached to us? Do we still have that? Are we still going to stick it out with our decisions? Say, yes, God, I'm going to fulfill those commitments I made. But there was a financial commitment. But more than that, a character commitment. A commitment of life. Say, you know, God, you're the most important thing. I'm going to fulfill those things that you spoke to me, Lord. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand together. These altars are open. You can come and find a place to pray and let, just let God help us tonight. One drop of blood that day was enough for humanity. Yes, God, we thank you tonight. On a hill the victory rock. Help us and I change us. The price was paid with his precious blood. Oh, worthy is your name. I wasn't there when Lord, the nails ripped us. through his hands. Holy, holy God. Oh, 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 oh. I wasn't there when his blood fell to the sand. I wasn't there when they hung him on a tree, but I'll be there when they bow at his feet. One drop of blood that day was enough for humanity. Blood. Praise God, amen. So maybe some of you here that are going to continue to pray, we're not cutting the altar call short. You just pray. But uh, perhaps, you know, you're, uh, you've been hurt by somebody or somebody's. And, uh, you know, you've made up your heart's mind that you're not going to trust again. You're not going to give yourself away like that again and serve like that because it hurts too much. This is why we tell people that minister. We say, you know what? You gotta make your heart skin and your your uh, your your, uh, your skin hard and your heart soft towards people, because we're all going to experience these hurts and and uh, disappointments, discouragements, discouragements, especially after a victory, especially after we've made some commitments, and then all of a sudden, boom! The devil, he he's, he the devil's a, a rascal. He plays you know dirty, light signs you. He blindsides you. He, he just takes shots, whether it be, you know, from somebody who really loves you and cares for you or, or things that, that come against your mind. And so uh, tonight, if you want to be free from that, from that mindset, from that lie of hell, I want you to come. We're going to pray for you. We're going to sing uh, one more verse of that song. And as he's <coughs> singing, I want you to come forward. We're going we're gonna to pray and let God help you tonight. Amen. Let God strengthen you. I wasn't there when they pierced his precious side. I wasn't there when he's hung his head and died. And I wasn't there when they mocked and scorned my king. But I'll be there when they bow at his feet. Praise God. Let's go ahead and pray for our sisters tonight. Amen. And thank you for your transparency, your honesty before God. And uh, there's a deliverance tonight where you can say, you know what, God? This is going to be broken once and for all. I'm settling this right here. And God's going to set you free. I want you just to lift up your hands to heaven. And I want you folks to just uh, point your hands towards them. And I want you to say, Father in heaven, thank you that you love me and that you do care for me. And I break every strategy of hell against my mind and against my life and against my destiny. And I forgive all those 
who have spoken evil words against my life or who have broken my heart. I commit them into your hands. Heal me tonight in my mind and in my spirit. And the blood of Jesus sets me free. I forgive them with all my heart in Jesus' name. And forgive me, Father, for allowing my heart to become hard. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I pray for my sisters right now. We bind every lie of hell. You devil, you have no dominion, no authority. We command you, loose him right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's thank God together. Father, we worship you. Lord, we glorify you. Praise God. Amen. We're going to go ahead and uh, dismiss tonight. Just remember the meeting. All those that are involved in the, in the concert scenes or uh, want to be involved, I'll we'll just meet with you just real briefly here to my right. Amen. Let's go ahead and bow our heads together. Maybe, Dan, you can ask the Lord's blessing as we dismiss. Father, we pray.